Before we begin the episode, I'd like to thank our sponsor, RTP Physiotherapy, founded by chartered physiotherapist Stony Fox and Thomas Dively. Based in St. Jude's GA Club, Temple Oak, RTP specialise in physiotherapy, return to play, physical health and performance. For more information, you can visit their website, rtp.physio, or their Instagram page, at physio underscore RTP for more. Welcome back to the Sideline Live podcast. You can follow us over on Twitter and Instagram at the Sideline Live. We'd love to hear from you. On episode 103, I'm delighted to be joined by performance nutritionist, best selling author, and founder of Davy Nutrition, Daniel Davy. On this episode, we discuss all things performance, his time at Leinster and the Dublin Senior Footballers, the impact of relationships, sustaining success, Jim Gavin, and so much more. Hi Daniel, thanks a million for joining me on the podcast. My pleasure, it's great to be here this morning. You're obviously in Sligo at the moment, so for you growing up, uh, sport was obviously a big influence in your life really. It was. Sport, farming and food. That was, you know, my youth was uh, about, um, it was about the potential of of playing first for your club and then looking on and seeing the senior players and doing what they could do and being a part of that and being a part of the community and uh, then hopefully one day going on and uh, potentially representing your county. So, yeah, I mean, your your environment and your home has a big influence on you and my home and uh, particularly my dad had a big influence because he had, he had played football uh even to inter-county level but Sligo in goals so it's a big part of a conversation throughout my youth mm-hmm. for you going through those um age groups at inter-county level and kind of realizing you had talent and making it to the senior panel what was that experience like for you kind of being first introduced into kind of a high performance that word is thrown around a lot environment how did you find the whole experience well we're talking about a good few years ago uh, so um, I'm going to be very honest and say that I I played with an intermediate team here in Sligo, and I like the, the <laughs> intermediate football was never really taken particularly seriously, and it didn't really matter how well I performed or what I did. The breaking into an inter county team. At, at all age grades was always that bit more challenging if you weren't from one of the senior clubs and you didn't have the exposure uh, of a of a, a you know St Mary's or a Tour de Strand so while I was fortunate to make development squads and I made all of the teams from you know under 16 up to under 21 breaking into the senior county team was a big challenge for me and uh it was something that I never gave up on and it was something that I always wanted to do, but it certainly wasn't like I went from under 21 into senior. That's not how it went. I had to go and play football in England with London and then come back uh, and play. But what I can say about it was it was always the space that I wanted to get into. And it was, it was the whole, it was the collective energy and just a collective effort that drove me on that's what I wanted to be a part of okay interesting I actually didn't know you played for London as well um what was it about the team is it kind of we were speaking before we hit record about kind of um the let's say community you get with a team and kind of the openness of that college team you observed what was it about a team that made you tick was it the being part of a group could you just pinpoint something that you'd love being part of a team because I get the sense I'd be the same I'd I'd struggle as an individual athlete I need my teammates I need people to be around well I didn't actually always I didn't necessarily always feel like that and I doubted whether I was suited to a team myself when I don't I, I, I've, I've moved away from the word obsession uh, it's I think that it's there, there's as there's potentially negative connotations and outcomes from obsession the same way as, as there's potentially positive things but when I was young I ran the roads you know, I started thinking about food from a very young age. I wouldn't, I wouldn't contemplate missing training, and not everybody shared that. So I often wondered, was I better off looking at a different sport where I was just accountable to myself? 
but as things went on and as time went on i i i felt the support of others when things weren't going well and you know you soon realize that you really no matter how hard you train uh and no matter how well you're playing you're always going to have periods where you're going to have dips or you're going to have your challenges and you need those people around you to to keep moving forward and that was that was something that i realized the, the value in and i and i think the other thing was as time went on i, I i'm struggling to find the right words the right way of putting it but i got a lot of satisfaction out of encouraging others you know that was something that did give me a sense of pride to 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 try and bring the best out in those around me. At the start of your professional career, I know you got involved kind of with the Dublin Herders in early stage, which yeah uh, led to opportunities with footballers, and then eventually Lancer. Talk us through the start of that career. I was working uh, with a supplement company called uh, ROS Nutrition back then, and I was part of that startup, and. I actually didn't necessarily want to get into the, that space, but jobs were incredibly limited uh, in, in performance nutrition back then. But a job came up with the Dublin Hurling team around 2010, uh, 2010, 2011. And I, uh, there's a, a, um, the standard conditioning coach at the time was Martin Kennedy. He was a good friend of mine. And he gave me the opportunity to, to present uh, a, 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 the strategies and programs, and it was it was amazing. Like I used to go to training; uh, they were in the gym at six o'clock. I'd, I'd try to get to trainings beforehand, or I'd go in the evenings. And there was a there was an unbelievable drive at that time, and there was a really good group. And Anthony Daly, Anthony Daly was managing the team, and uh, you know he had a lot of experience, and he knew what it took to to be successful and uh I, I i just loved every single aspect of it i loved the curiosity and the interest and it was the first real time that i saw my input having a measurable difference and uh i just knew that that was the path i wanted to go brilliant i was actually in nada uh, martin's company and i remember being in saint david's and seeing all of the equipment, it would have been about 2014, 2015, and seeing all the Dublin footballers and the, the leaderboard and all the different yeah. stats. I definitely think there yeah. was like a mental thing at that you'd be able to look at. I think it's actually interesting. Stephen Cluxon was up at the top of a lot of those categories. Mm. I think there was, nearly, he was. there was nearly a mental thing where you go into the environment and you see who's the leaderboard and you're going to chase the pack and chase the leader. Mm. But it's, it's mm. interesting that you see all that come straight in with the Dublin hurlers. In, even in 2010, like everyone says, you know, intercounty has gone so professional, but it probably started back at the late 08, 09, 10, do you think? Definitely. You know, there's no doubt at that point that there were the structures being put in place uh, for, for, for high performance and for people to excel. What I suppose... Um, what has changed is that there's been a, a big development in the broader picture. You know, while things like um, the different pillars, whether it be sleep, psychology, nutrition, the management of 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 volume of of training and the intensity that these athletes are working at, there's just a greater depth of understanding of what that what that looks like. And I think that uh, the other thing that's fascinating is that the, the cultures have evolved so much that there's mo- just more buy into the whole to, to, to the whole thing. You know, there's a, there's a real recognition now that you're not going to be at your best if you're not committed to this. Yeah, exactly. And you used to discuss that before and I wasn't going to get into the in- tr- in kind of the the real details of nutrition but something you mentioned before was you know a lot of it's actually based in habits and the kind of psychology are you open to change and are you willing to change your daily habits because um even like i've heard intercounty players speak before at camps and different things they're like you know how do you kind of eat healthy and it's like it's actually just a habit you know the 80 20 rule they know when they go to the petrol station they don't pick up the packet of crisps they pick up the the fruit Mm -hmm. snack or the protein bar or something but that's Mm -hmm. actually ultimately what you think nutrition is down to it's just those habits and those psychological factors yeah so when 
I would begin the conversation with anybody around nutrition. Uh, you talk about you talk about the skills. So what are their skills? What are their practical abilities? Uh, what are then that, that that comes down to how they plan, how they manage their time, their cooking skills, uh, their their understanding of 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 how food is put together, and then there's the knowledge aspect. Do you have the knowledge to put those meals together? Do you know when to eat? Do you know the timings? Do you know what food fits at the right place? Uh, and then there's the there's the person's own drive, interest, desire, and that's the that's the mental skills associated with it. So really understanding how to uh, how to create a strategy around all of that, and uh, at the very core of that is is how you behave and the habits that you form. So if you're not focused on building out those habits and if you if you don't have them in a in in a way that is incremental and sustainable then you know no matter how good your skills are no matter where your knowledge is then uh, you you you're not going to maintain a level of consistency that's needed to be successful okay interesting there's a great quote you had um i think it was on the movement 101 podcast and you said every single person who works as part of a backroom team, whether it's Dublin or Leinster, is held accountable for success and failure. What's that like in an environment, let's say, for example, if I was to go in as a player saying I'm not used to it, is it an adjustment period? Do you help players adjust to that? Is it? Is it? How did you find that environment? Because I suppose there's a lot of responsibility there put on every individual there, not only the players on the pitch. Uh, are you talking about when it, I started or are you talking about a minor, broader picture? Maybe even the evolution of, did you see it kind of coming in more? Is it now, Did it was it always like that even when you started? It Was it more towards the latter end of your career with Leinster in Dublin? Uh, what has happened over the last 12 years is that the... This, the margins have just become so much tighter and uh, the the expectations have become so much higher about what's needed. <clears throat> so I really didn't, I didn't really feel that pressure when I would have started. Um, I would have been very excited about the opportunity and I would have been very much all in on, you know, it... <laughs> There was weeks where I would have done 60, 70, 80 hours. And when I wasn't working, I was thinking about how I could improve my job. So it completely consumed me. But then what begins to happen is that you, you know, you set a standard, you have expectations of yourself, then the players have expectations, the management of expectations. And it's very hard to sustain all of that. Uh, and, and it's hard to evolve it. Um, so what I what I'm much more conscious of now is making sure within any environment or any team that I'm associated with, just making sure that people have the essential aspects of nutrition covered and that they're that they they have the tools to perform. And 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 you can then allow you, you, you can evolve things more sustainably over time and introduce different things. But I would have gone crash wallop bang uh, and made some big mistakes when I went from, let's say, even Dublin to Leinster because there was a very streamlined process that I wasn't used to. And it was like, I was thinking about it from, well, from a nutrition strategy perspective, that doesn't really make that much difference. But they had established structures and I didn't, uh, in the early stages, I didn't realize how important it was that the structure was over the importance of the strategy. So, like, they would have hydration testing in Leinster at very specific times. And that was just the way things were done. So, if, if I missed that, I wouldn't think it would be a bigger deal. I could just do it at a time <laughs> that I felt was more relevant. But that's not how they did it. So, so, so it's, it's managing that as well as, so as, as the actual practice, it's, it's merging the two together. Okay. Interesting. Do you think that's the biggest 
or maybe it's just the evolution blends but is is that sort of the biggest difference between you see the professional setup versus an intercounty team that they can have these kind of Monday to Friday blocks of let's say specific hydration testing in the morning or in the afternoon where you don't have access to an intercounty player for not only hydration te- testing but for anything. Uh, th- that's one element of it for sure. Uh, I think there's just when you're in a, an office environment and you're in there, whether it be three or five days a week, there's um, there's expectations that are, are are just created over time because there's just an intensity about every aspect of what people do because that's their job that you can't really explain. So the smallest example I can give you is, you know, let's say the food is late by 15 minutes. Honestly, it's like, I need to be careful here, but, you know, every single thing is, may, may, I'm not saying it is, but may need to be pushed back after that because there's a schedule in place. There's a meeting at at one forty five. There's a Bax meeting at two o'clock. There's a there's a there's a management meeting at two thirty. You know, there's another, and so it creates that bit of chaos. And 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 that was all because the food was late. You know, so it feels like there's an awful lot more pressure on something like that. Whereas if that happened in Dublin training, the lads would be like, "Oh sure, I'll just I'll just eat it at home. I'll bring it with me." Like it's just completely different. What do you think, let's say, a professional setup could learn from an intercounty setup then? Like, obviously, <laughs> obviously, like, intercounty set, I know managers have gone into pro setups. I know Deccan Darcy's now involved with Leinster. But mm-hmm. what can the professional side of things take from the intercounty scene? Well, I, I talked about this every single week uh, in, in, in my job in Leinster. And I had these conversations with, with management and colleagues and like Leo, Leo and Stuart were uh, in Leinster very, very open to learning from my experience of working with Dublin. And they would have asked me every single week, how are things are going and what, what's been done and what, what can we learn? So it's not that there, there's, there's certainly no, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I, 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 the words aren't coming to me, but they're, they're certainly, they're not positioning themselves like they, they have all the answers. There is that, that interest in learning. I think if I'm, if I'm, if I was to pick something very specific, I think there's, um, there's a, there's a real, there's a really good culture in GA and, and certain aspects of what they do from, from a broader connection to the culture and to the community. And uh, like, you know, what's gone on before we feel in GA, we feel very connected to. And um, I think in the professional game, people can move through there very quickly. They can have careers for two or three years and then they're out, they're gone. Whereas like I played for my home club and I played for Ballyboden for eight, nine years. And I like, I feel at home in both of them. You know, you don't feel like you're just, you're on the outside now. And I suppose there's, there's little elements like that you know, I even see Leinster have done the 12 county court uh, tour this year, trying to, to connect more to uh, the history and that the players understand more about the, all of the counties that are, that are in Leinster. And so there's that there's there's lots of different elements like that that I find interesting, but it's not one particular thing. There's definitely lots of elements about, you know, even simple things like um, the holidays, like the team holidays and what those experiences were like with Dublin uh, and and how that brings groups together is is very powerful. How close is the intercounty setup to the professional 
And do you think we're kind of reaching this breaking point that, yes, we're striving to be the best athletes and footballers we can be, but I'm also striving to have this professional career and they're pushing me to the top. We're kind of, are we going to hit a great breaking point at one point, do you think? I don't know if we're going to hit a breaking point. You know, if we haven't hit one now, I I don't know if there's a breaking point coming. I think it, you know, the, the, the GA at inter-county level it, you know, it is elite sport. Uh, it is, you know, the only thing that's that it's not called is, you know, what it's not is professional just because the players are not being paid. But it is the the investment of time and the attention that's going in at, at senior county level is every bit as much as professional sport. And if I was to look at, like I'm involved with Bally Bowden, uh, still just helping out uh, more in a supporting type of role and like what they're doing is what most inter-county teams are doing uh, there's nothing there's there's nothing there's only there's only maybe more resources available and but it's, like it's practically inter-county at, at club level too in Dublin wow okay because I was going to ask you about Bally and your role in there but it seems to be obviously Bally the sincere like a serious club and obviously great mm. pedig- uh, pedigree but to see mm. I was going to ask you what's it like kind of maybe to take maybe a mini step back but it it seems like you you mm. haven't actually taken a huge step back from Elite Sport because Bally Bowden is at such an elite level well one of the so I'm, I'm not working with Dublin or Leinster anymore and I've you know I've, I've moved on to do my own thing but something that I recognized very very quickly uh, I mean within the space of two or three weeks is that I couldn't go I, I, I just can't be without the conversations with the athletes around their performance it's just it's too important to me uh, so I, I, I Kenny Nocton is the is the Bally Bowden manager and I have a very good relationship with him and a lot of the played with all of the backroom team. And I played with a lot of the players too. And I, I, I you know, there's a very, very good energy in, in the group um, and this really good attitude and there's a great openness uh, to feedback. Um, so no, no, I, I did. I actually, I transferred home uh after the all ireland so in 2016 and i played at home for a couple of years and that was great too because i reconnected with a lot of people back home and that you know that was just great and got to play and my dad see me play again and all that kind of thing so that was really positive but no i've 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 moved back in <laughs> just it's not a very formal role but i am i am connected to the group and that feels really good you mentioned there, speaking about athletes, of all the players you've, you could even pull on your playing career here, you've played with, against or observed or just had an opportunity to talk to. What are the common traits or patterns that you see between the elite players that are just that 1% ahead of the rest? Uh, it's a very consistent pattern and it is that there's just, there's a, somebody said to me once, uh, that there's a different look in their eye. <laughs> and I think that's so interesting because I, when that person said, it was actually a woman uh, that I met and was talking to sport and she doesn't, she's not directly involved in sport, but she's really interested in sport. And she started, we had this conversation around elite athletes. She said, there's just, such, there's a different look in their eye. And what I would describe it as is, uh, is an ongoing interest and curiosity that there's they're just not closed off to new ideas and like that was the biggest thing from my experience in dublin that i did some of the you know i had the freedom to do some of the things that would be considered absolutely off the wall but there was an openness where they were like oh we'll give it a chance you know we'll we'll, we'll have a think about it and, and we'll try it without without just saying this doesn't work and then if like they didn't work I said oh geez Daniel, that was an absolute waste of time but I I had the opportunity and I felt that I could try these things so what what of course you need ability and of course you need resilience and of course you need to have the the physical attributes to play the game but uh the yeah if I was to narrow it down it's that curiosity and all and also that 
just that ability to bounce back from injury or when they make that mistake, just how quickly athletes reset. Um, that 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 that's that tends to be a big part of of who they are okay very interesting have you picked up anything from the athletes different methods that they use different concepts they have for themselves every day uh every single day i was in there i and being around the these athletes you just see it's it's just astounding to watch belief on front of your eyes, like total belief. And it was only when I started playing football in Dublin myself and I was surrounded by people who, you know, there's this attitude, we're just not going to be defeated. And it it's, it's that um, willingness to openly say, that we are the best and that we are we we are going to do whatever it takes and that there's a total commitment of actions to that language and um like you you can get incredible buy in from from people who who have that attitude once once you're leading by actions too so um the, the, I suppose the big thing for me when I look at those the, those athletes, it was that the work was always done. And then if there was something else that needed to be do, done, they'd do that too. And it was whatever it, whatever it was, whether it be cold water immersion, whether it be the clothes that they wore, the undergarments. You know, if I, I would, if I said it was two bananas versus three bananas. If I said it was blueberries instead of cherries, you know, they just, they just did, they trusted the process and, and did what was necessary. And is that, when you say trust the process, is that something that's, um, is that something that's kind of reflected down? Like even you said there, you know, you're, you're leading by actions, but is that something, how did management set up, put that in and, and give that structure to players to have that buy-in or was it just ultimately the character of the, the individuals involved? I don't know there's no question that the that 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 was created, and that the whole idea of 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 achieving success and sustaining success was that if we are not buying into this collectively, this can't be sustained. You know, sustained success requires very clear standards in place for for that to be achieved. And it's 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 led from the top, and then it comes from the bottom up, you know. But but all of those things, they have to be real. They can't be for show, you know. It's all this. It, 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 there's so many references to, you know, what's done in the dark or what's done when people aren't watching. Like there's that comes to the surface. Like that really does come out if people buy into that or not. Uh, and people who don't just don't stay the course. Mm, good point. How do you measure su- success when you're working with an athlete or with a team? Obviously, the team goals they have their own goals, but for you going into that setup as a performance nutritionist, what are your what are your measurables? How do you measure success with a with a client? It's it's incredibly complicated and it's evolved a huge amount. And the easy way to say that uh, my relationship or my support is measured, uh, the the really easy way, and the, you know, if you just if you just want to, if you if you just want to look at it from a quantitative perspective, and you want metrics, it's, you know, it's it's distance covered, it's body fat, it's muscle mass. It's um, it's the weights that are lifted in the gym. It's energy levels. But for me, as I moved on and I moved on from Leinster and moved on from Dublin, it's the quality of the relationship. It's the language that they use around food and that they use around mindset. It's an openness. It's a willingness to try things. It's lifelong skills that they're going to use themselves 
to keep themselves healthy and keep themselves energy keep themselves energized and it's the influence that they're going to have on on their family but that does really it comes down to the quality of the relationship and that's something i value hugely and measure you know if i think about the success it's like how would i feel if the athletes that i worked with were in fantastic shape performing really well avoiding injury and illness uh being successful on the field of play but yet i couldn't have a conversation with them outside of it and i'd never relation a relationship with them i think that would I, I would find that very difficult and i'd find it really hard to feel like that was a successful uh, period of time or relationship I love the way you, that's how kind of you what you reference because I've been working with different coaches and, and and as a coach and it's like you might have you might not be the most qualified or have the most knowledge but it's actually sometimes down to the relationship you have with the athlete or with the coach. Mm, yeah. No, there's 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 absolutely no question about it and just as you mentioned Martin Kennedy like one of the reasons like my personal relationship with Martin has always been very strong. But, you know, when when Martin moved on from Dublin, Martin was gone two years and we would be sitting around after games and somebody would mention Martin Kennedy and somebody would say what a man Martin Kennedy was. And they'd say something like, you know, I don't know how he knew that there was something that just wasn't right or I wasn't myself, but I'd get a message from Martin going, you know, how are you doing? How are you feeling? And like that said an awful lot to me. You know, I I, I thought to myself, you know, can, can you imagine if I was gone from Dublin, you know, I'm gone a year. I'm sorry, this last year was misty. Like if I was gone and somebody said, do you remember Daniel told us this? Like, <laughs> I think that's what I wanted. That's it. And I, and I knew that it was not going to be how many grams of protein or how many carbs that they consumed that that was going to have that impact. Yeah. Yeah, no, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, out of interest then, kind of Jim Gavin, I think, is an interesting character. I'm trying to get him on the podcast, proven difficult. But uh, how, what did you learn from him? How did you find him as a leader and, and uh, to work with and his approach with the players? Yeah, I mean, uh, Jim, Jim was a visionary and uh, Jim was an extraordinary leader and he, you know, it's as, as time goes on and the further that you're out of the environment or the longer I'm out of the environment, you realize just the impact and the legacy that he's left. And the reason why he was so successful was because he was so clear on the, the values that he wanted to establish, what team first meant, what it meant to get complete buy-in and have trust within the group of the, the all of the processes that were being implemented. But even while there was that level of standards, that level of, of, of challenge, there was huge autonomy. And you were once once you knew or he knew that you were meeting the, the the standards of the group, you were given free reign to shape the program as you felt would best meet the the needs of the players and the group. And that was amazing. Like that was that was so fulfilling because you really felt like you were having a tangible uh, impact. But the other thing was that Jim always asked really good questions. And he always supported my messages. So, uh, you know, whether that be on the bus after the game or, you know, Daniel, is there anything you want to say before training? Like that is, that is empowerment. You know, that is sending such a strong message to the group that he believed in my message. And uh, I will always be very grateful for that. When you mentioned questioning, is that again down to that curiosity that we mentioned earlier, that kind of, you know, always open to new ideas, always looking for that extra edge? Like nobody I could explain, he he believed he believed in that constant drive that there was always something that would help to keep the group uh, ahead of the competition. But I even mean he would challenge me around, like let's say for example, <laughs> 
I remember uh, one day. Um, I remember one day. Uh, he wants me to push something around the energy levels because and the level of energy that the players were using, uh, that the level of carbohydrate or energy the players were consuming because the training sessions were going to be really tough. And um, I talked about the amount of specific carbohydrate that was required. And he brought me out onto the field and he said, can you talk me through that again? And I talked him through it again in front of the group. And he said, well, why isn't that here? <laughs> and I said, you know, I, it wasn't that it wasn't there. It wasn't, it was that it wasn't there in the specific form that he wanted it in. You know, he wanted a gel, a drink, an electrolyte drink, and that all options should be there if this is what we're driving. And, you know, whether I was right or wrong or, that that wasn't the point. It was that he was making it really clear. If you said this is important, well, then this should be here in these forms for these players to, to consume it. And like, it just constantly kept you on your toes. Okay, very good. I actually think it might have been him, but the saying, good people make good players, do you agree with this? Is this something, is it a cliche? What do you make of it? I... Um, I um I don't know. Uh I I would love to say that you know there's a there's a really close you know that the both of them are intertwined and that the relationship between being a good person and a and a and a good athlete uh you know that there's that there's that symbiosis and 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 that they're equally invested in both. I, like one of the nicest players I've ever met in my life, one of the most generous and kind, is uh, is Josh van der Fleer, who is also you know when I think about all the things that we've talked about, of being what what a great professional is and what a great person is, then. This, there's the perfect example and you've had Johnny Cooper on this as well. He's one of the most selfless people, one of the most giving people and one of the most supporting of, of me, uh, particularly as our relationship developed over the years. But there are people who are brutally selfish, who are ex exceptional, exceptional sports people. And uh, I, I think if you were to ask the question, as a team sport, does a do, do good people? If you've got good people in the environment and they are selfless and they are driving good behaviors, and it is about the collective, I think that's what's needed to sustain success. But um, people on an individual basis can still get to the top and compete at the highest level <laughs> for themselves. Yeah, and that's the argument that I've kind of mentioned a few times in the podcast. It's like. You have to be so selfish in your own preparation and your own training and to push yourself to be your best. But then when you're a part of a team, when you step into the doors, that has to go out the window. It has to be about the group. It has to be about the collective. And sometimes it's difficult for athletes because you're going from such a selfish mindset of me, me, me to the team. And that can sometimes be a really mm. difficult concept to grasp. Well, what I would say about that is that it depends on what you want your legacy to be so you know if you want to pass on what you've learned and you want it to be for the better of the group then then you can do that um but you need to have that mindset but you know so it's this it, it's a it is the fine balance uh, and i have seen people do it incredibly well but i also think that you need very strong management that um that has that has equal standards for all, and unless that's happening, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to manage when when people are self driven. The GEA kind of have a great model with you know everyone everyone has a chance at inter county. It's all you know inclusive. But can anyone be an elite athlete? Does it take a certain characteristic or not characteristic, but traits? What do you think? I think anybody can be an elite athlete. Like I've I I see people go on after playing GAA at junior level or 
intermediate level and do extraordinary things in other sports. I think we, we have an idea in our head because of society and what we see in media and social media of, of what it means. But the reality of it is just, it, it, I, I try and communicate this around performance. So you're, you know, you're talking about it. You're talking about an attitude towards how you perform day to day. You know, I see people run businesses, CEOs and directors of companies, and they're operating at the highest, highest level, making really strategic decisions. But they don't invest the same way in their wellness or they don't invest in their health and they don't see that in order to sustain those decisions and sustain their their bodies mentally and physically managing that stress that if they don't if they haven't built up that resilience they 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 won't maintain it so it's a it's a it's a broader more holistic set of behaviors and if you have that mindset towards it anybody anybody can be a high performer anybody can be an elite athlete i recently had um retired our sevens rugby player foster horan on and i asked him to kind of dispel any myths about kind of elite level sport and one thing he picked up on was interesting was drinking bans. It's something we see a lot in kind of the amateur setup of GA club where they come in, the senior manager comes in and says, lad, you know, we're on a drinking ban till at least March because we've pre-season. Um, from a performance standpoint, is it, you know, drinking bans, are they effective? What, are your, what is your take on it? Oh, look, I've done skits to this. Like drinking bans don't don't work. There's There's absolutely no question or doubt about it. The only thing that I would say is like it's the players and the players like the the leaders within a group that have to set these standards and what that looks like and uh, that's that's about the broader culture and if you you will find that if people are a drinking alcohol and if they're over consuming or they're abusing alcohol then there's there's going to be other aspects of the preparation that they're compromising on as well you know, whether that be sleep or that be nutrition, whether that be the work that they need to do in training, whether that be their rehab or prehab, whatever it might be, you'll find that that's been compromised. So it's it's very easy. And it, it, when you pick one or two things and you go really hard at it, that's that's about a statement, but it's very narrow minded. Um, so but but just to just to finish by or just to add that. Like there's absolutely no question that alcohol is extremely detrimental uh, when consumed excessively. Like I mean, it's it's scary because I come from a home we 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 love a, a a glass of wine with dinner. You know, I have as time has gone on been made so much more aware of of the implication if of the implications of sustained overconsumption of alcohol and we do need to nurture a more positive relationship and that starts with not having drinking bans and creating safe environments um within groups like uh, one of the things about Bally Bowden that I think is just a, fantastic is like they'll meet for a couple of pints after a championship game and it's about them being together uh, and it's it's like does, I haven't seen anybody being drunk you know, so that's what I'm talking about. That's that's when it's not being abused and it's it's being used for the right reasons uh, and that there's a, a fun and morale element to it and that's where it stopped. And and the other thing I want I'd I'd add is that there's no peer pressure. I see five and six lads not drinking on those nights out and there's not a word said. I want to ask you actually, particularly about Barry Bowden. You said, um, I think it was again the Movement One One podcast. That was a great interview, by the way. You said winning a club all Ireland wasn't satisfying. Can you explain that statement because, kind of, you know, we dream of you know growing up playing in Crow Park, winning all Ireland medals. But to kind of hear that from somebody that has done it, what was your take and perspective on it for anyone listening that might have these dreams and aspirations, and you kind of build it up in your head to be this pinnacle of success, and for you, it wasn't. I think if you had asked uh, some of the other players, it, it, it very well might have been. Uh, I think that was probably a little bit too personal to me. Um, if I'm being, if I'm telling the whole truth about it, I, so 
I suppose just to give you a very, 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 very quick insight to my mindset. When I say I'm all in on something, when I when I'm committed to something, I mean every fiber of what I do. Every every cell points to that direction when I'm when I'm focused on it. I mean, I am totally, totally consumed by it. And my vision for you talked about vision for success my vision for success is measured in contribution it's measured on impact and it's measured in value and what tended to happen uh, particularly throughout that period of time was i was an older member of the squad and i gave all that i possibly could you know physically mentally and to the group but I wanted my impact to be measured on what I was contributing on the field. And I felt like there was a lot of references to my leadership and there was a lot of references to the kind of impact that I was having on the broader culture. And that just not, that wasn't why I was putting my boots on. So when that was over, I would have looked back and felt that there was other games and there was other things that I was a part of that I made much bigger contributions to that felt much more gratifying and fulfilling the thing as well i suppose was that that was that was a that was a huge pinnacle it was a huge moment and like the come down like i've never i've never said this before but my mother thought i i, I didn't i wouldn't say i slipped into depression i don't think i've i've suffered from depression but the low off the back of the all ireland was just I can't I can't describe how low it was. Okay. Was that because of the the impact you wanted to have and you didn't necessarily have that? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a big uh, I think that's a big part of it, but also the fact that it was the guts of two years of work and now it was over. And again, I've never said this before, but you know, while I was uh, incredibly proud of and, and wouldn't have, you know, <laughs> of my associations at Dublin and Leinster, I had to go back into those environments. And I was ashamed of not having the impact. Like that day, that was not how I had envisaged my day, you know. That was not how I envisaged what not Ireland should feel like. And I was I was ashamed of my lack of contribution. And that stayed with me. And there's even as I'm saying it, you know, there's still elements of it. Because here's the thing. I know uh, I, I would have had huge belief about what my impact could be. And I knew that that wasn't a fair reflection of it. And that's really hard to live with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, de- no, it definitely is. And it's it's kind of, again, back to that elite performance environment where it's difficult, like it's not only physically challenging, but mentally. What is it? I get the sense from talking to you that it's actually more of a mental challenge being involved at such an elite level while there is such physical challenges and such physical training, but that mental aspect might be the, the tougher element. I don't think there's any doubt about that. I think that... I think the way that people have to deal with injury, they have to deal with non-selection, uh, being left out of squads, being out of form, and the, the like. You need to be so resilient to manage all that, and uh, figure your way through it. And I would have done my best to support athletes going through that and always making them feel like there is something there's a plan that can be done to help you get through this and just that they would have felt supported but you know when it comes down to it when it boils down to it in life we have to do this stuff ourselves and sometimes that's really hard (laughs) we have to find it from within you know that's that's it that's it Great point. I was telling you before we hit record what I'm doing next week, but if I could hand you the key to any, it might, maybe not sport, but any setup in the world to go in and be a fly on the wall for a week, what would it be and why? Who would it be and why? Um, I, 
it's a really good question. Um, and I'm not sure I know the answer to that because as I was saying to you, when um when I was at that training last week with Northwestern and uh, I was in their environment and I saw them train and I saw the energy between them, the openness, the curiosity, the music, the vibrancy, like I could feel something, uh, you know, stir inside me that w- would have loved to experience this as a, as an athlete myself and where it could have brought me. So you don't know where that is. That's what I'm saying. But I'm, I am, I am fascinated by the likes of the, the Navy SEALs uh, and the kind of uh, what that what they have to endure and uh, how that that space has evolved and what are the limits of human performance and what what can be done to prepare people for the greatest feats of performance and you know when I would have heard stories from Navy SEALs or people who have operated in those in those arenas and in those real life situations just how those um people make decisions under pressure which are life and death and usually it's just the responsibility associated with that compared to kicking a ball over the bar you know so that 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 intrigues me Brilliant. I'm very conscious of time because I feel like we could keep talking for hours here. I, I'm going to move on to the sideline seven. It's the same seven questions at the end of every episode. Uh, question one, Daniel, what is your favourite quote? There's a, there's a, I, I won't, it's, um, I'll paraphrase, there's a David Katz, um, he is the former uh, president of uh, Lifestyle Me- Medicine um, in, in, in the States. Uh, he talks about knowledge versus practice and it's not what we know it's what we do with what we know and that phrase and that quote uh, has driven me to read more to talk more to reflect more on my practice to help people apply themselves more and use the information that they have and understand that that the tools are within themselves for success Okay, interesting. Is there any particular book that's kind of st- stood out to you then when you're searching along that kind of going, taking that quote as your kind of your kind of benchmark? Is there any particular book you found ben- beneficial towards that? Uh, many, um, but uh, not directly correlated to David Katz. It's more the Matthew Syed books, the Black Book Box Thinking, the Rebel Ideas. Uh, I'm sure you know you've read them yourselves, but it's the it's the it's the James Clear and Charles Duhigg, uh, The Power of Habit. It's these books that get us think, thinking an awful lot more about what drives our subconscious, what influences our decisions on an emotional level, on a physiological level, rather than just the information that's presented to us. Presented. Like, I can't tell you how many questions I get every day about whether it's one banana or three bananas or, you know, is milk good or how many eggs? Like We're just, we continue to miss the point when it comes to our health. Okay, interesting. Question two, best sporting event you've been to and you can pick one as a fan and one that you were involved in in any capacity. Um, any of the All-Ireland finals and the Champions Cup final in Bilbao was, um, was truly extraordinary in the way that that finished um, but uh, the All Ireland final between Dublin and Mayo as well in 2018, another, you know, just extraordinary experiences. Mm-hmm. Question three What's been the biggest setback or challenge so far in your career, and how did you react to it? <laughs> uh, well, I'll, because I told you about it, I'm going to tell you that. Um, that experience around the All Ireland final was a big, big setback. And um, how did I respond to it? Not well for a long period of time. And um, but good things came out of it. I, I I moved home and I played football at home, and I I found I found something really new. It it was an opportunity to try things and to build new 
and renew relationships. So that was really positive. Brilliant. Question four, kind of on the flip side then, what's been your biggest achievement on or off the pitch? My biggest achievement has been a, a theme that's run throughout our conversations. My biggest achievement has been figuring out how to help people find their strengths and uh, realize that they can achieve things like helping people to really unlock their potential, you know, and, and, and that's by, that's by asking the right questions. Okay. Very good. Looking back. Learning to ask the right question. Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, looking back, what advice would you give your 18 year old self? That who you are is good enough and that, um, You'll figure it out. Okay, very good. Who would be your dream dinner guest and why? You can open up the table to a few people if you want. I have uh, I have dinner um, with some of my friends every year and uh, it's uh, around Christmas and we joke about Roy Keane coming to dinner <laughs> um, because we've all been Roy Keane fans and that would be make it more interesting. But I, I can tell you that... Um, they're, the dinners around Christmas and the 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 dinners that we have as friends, we're we're pretty good with the groups that we have. Roy Keane has been referenced. I don't know how many times at this point uh, during that question, but for you, Daniel, what are you cooking uh, for that sort of meal? Are you getting a takeaway? What what's your go to? I, I I've made. Uh, homemade lasagna and even I've had Paul Mannion and Paddy Andrews and some of those lads over a few times to the house and I've made I've made vegetarian lasagna and regular lasagna with fresh pasta sheets and it's a it's it's really good it's a great sharing dish okay very good final question before I let you go you've been so generous with your time if your life was a book what chapter would this be called Empower. Empower. Love it. I know you have your own two books coming out. You have plenty of stuff on social media. Where is the best place for any of the listeners to find you if they want to reach out or ask you a question? Yeah, thank you very much. My, uh, I actually have a big book launch uh, for my new book on the 28th of October at home in Sligo. So if anybody who's listened to this in the West of Ireland wants to come and join and get their book signed, that would be great. Um, but uh, at Davy Nutrition, uh, and my first name is Daniel again, <laughs> at Davy Nutrition on, on social media and davynutrition.com on my website. Brilliant. Daniel, thanks a million for coming on and best of luck with everything going forward. Thank you for your time and having me on. Appreciate it. A big thank you to Daniel for joining me on the podcast today. I thoroughly enjoyed our chat and I hope you got something from it. I just want to wish him the best of luck with his brand new book launch in the next couple of weeks and I'll be sure to leave a link in the description box below. If you are enjoying the podcast, please do leave a rating and a review over on Apple Podcasts and Spotify as it does help the show grow. A massive thank you for your, all your support to date and I'll catch you in the next one.